Right, good, good evening everybody and uh, thank you for coming. Um, the hat I've got on tonight is that of a trustee of uh, the Susan Trust and uh, I'm also very pleased that uh, David Goodridge is here, uh, another fellow trustee and the treasurer of the Susan Trust. So he'll be keeping his eye on this little pot in the uh, front here all evening. Um, Susan, a unique restoration project we feel who is Susan? Susan is the only surviving wooden Chelmer and Blackwater lighter. It's the only lighter uh, that was built for the Chelmer and Blackwater navigation that had an inboard engine. But her design goes back to medieval boats, the barges that were used on the estuaries around this area. And uh, we'll see that as we go on, how you know she does look like the earlier barges. And also very much like the uh, horse-drawn barges that were on the navigation at the time she was introduced. She's of considerable maritime interest and she is designated now as a vessel on the National Historic Register of Historic Vessels, uh, which I think is uh, illustrating her importance. Who is the Susan Trust? The Susan Trust is a partnership of experienced organisations that have been involved with Susan previously and those we have trustees that come from the Chelmer Lighter Preservation Society, from the Inland Waterways Association, from the Chelmer Canal Trust, Dudley represents the trusts as a trustee and also from Chelmsford Borough Council, that's the former council now the city council in Chelmsford. And the aims of the Susan Trust are to raise funds to restore, maintain and operate Susan, to organise her restoration, to ensure her future operation and maintenance. That's very important if you are funding the restoration of a vessel, that it doesn't just end there. She's got to earn her keep, she's got to be maintained for the future. And to continue to promote Susan's existence, her history and her future. And those that don't know Susan, and she has been absent from the navigation for a little while now, uh, this is Susan underway in um, 1997, heading up towards Chelmsford, passing under the A138 Chelmer Viaduct, uh, soon to be a historic slide because that um, bridge will be demolished within the next year. So a bit more history to the navigation that is changing. As far as history goes, uh, this is uh, an early postcard showing the navigation at, um, at um, Bentall's warehouse next to Wave Bridge, taken from Wave Bridge, and showing one of the horse-drawn lighters um, heading down towards Haybridge Basin. Uh, interesting, I always think of these early slides at how neat the navigation is, how it's not uh, overgrown because of its use, how the towpath is well maintained and uh, I think that's very typical of what we see on the earlier photographs and slides of the navigation. And here's another postcard, this time uh, at Beely Weir, uh, another horse-drawn um, boat uh, heading up into Beely Lock, into the main lock, uh, on its way towards Chelmsford. Interesting, that one doesn't seem to be particularly well loaded, but of course there were all sorts of cargoes on the navigation at that time, not just timber. And an interesting uh, thing that I've always found with the lighters on the Chelmer and Blackwater is that it was the Chelmer and Blackwater lighters that helped save many of the Thames sailing barges because the Thames sailing barges were actually used uh, as lighters in themselves to unload coasters off O.C. Island, coasters of timber. They transferred the timber onto the demasted Thames barges, brought them into Haybridge Basin and then unloaded it again onto the Chelmer and Blackwater lighters to bring the timber up into Chelmsford. Uh, this boat here is Morosa, the sailing barge. She is still uh, in use. I think she's based at St. Oseth now, which is where uh, Susan is as well. But uh, a lot of the Thames sailing barges were saved because of those operations that extended their life. The history of Susan, she was actually built for Brown and Son timber merchants in Chelmsford. Brown & Son is the company that was uh, originally established by um, William Coates, the resident engineer on the navigation, 
uh, and then it passed on through his family, became Brown and Sons, and then at a later time it transferred to Travis Perkins, who still have a presence on the basin, but no longer obviously bring timber in. Um, she was built in 1953 by Prize at Burnham on Crouch. She worked only through until the late 1950s, as far as we're aware, uh, because by that time steel barges were coming in and uh, they had got certain advantages over the timber boats, uh, which we'll have a little look at later on. But after that time, she became a maintenance boat for Chalmer and Blackwater Navigation Company, carrying out repairs on the navigation. Then in uh, 1972, the movement of timber up into Chance had stopped as late as 1972, and that meant there were a lot of other barges available. The steel barges had become available, and uh, the navigation company obviously took on a steel barge, so they didn't have the maintenance costs of a timber boat, and uh, Susan, I'm afraid, was... Uh, threatened with being broken up. In fact, the navigation company took out her Thornycroft engine and offered it for sale as a commencement of, of their acts of actually breaking up the vessel. And I do remember other boats being broken up on the navigation. I think after IWA had purchased Susan in 1976, um, some years later we were asked, would we like Jimmy as well? And uh, we thought, well, no, thank you very much. Um, I think one is quite enough uh, when you look at the costs of restoration and upkeep. And uh, I think one is probably adequate to uh, preserve the heritage of the navigation and the lighters. So this is her in 1976 when IWA uh, took her over. Um, I can't remember who gave me this slide, but it suddenly turned up and I looked at that and I thought, oh yeah, that's actually me standing inside her. Uh, and uh, I remember visiting her with uh, other uh, um, people, uh, other sort of trustees from IWA, committee members, and uh, sort of looking at uh, what we'd actually taken on uh, and what we were going to do with her. <coughs> so IWA uh, looked after or owned her right, th right through until 1979 when Chioma Lighter Preservation Society was formed. And Susan was then purchased by um, the Lighter Preservation Society in order to get her back into working order. In 1981, as a commencement of that aim, they were able to buy back and install the original Thornycroft engine again. And they then started a whole series of working parties uh, volunteers working on Susan to maintain her and to restore her uh, and also to use their volunteers to operate her at various events and occasions along the navigation. So, uh, 79, when the Chelmer Lighter Preservation Society were taking her over, here she is at uh, Little Baddow in the Coal Wharf. Um, she was often left sunken uh, because that was a way of protecting her timbers, keeping them swollen and, and stopping them shrinking. So when she did sink, um, she, she was often left like that for quite a long period. And again in 1981, here she is moved up to Sanford. Uh, the water level in the navigation has been lowered so that they can attempt to bail her out and refloat her. Uh, and you can see um, Chelmolida Preservation Society volunteers there bailing her out and uh, I presume at 81, uh, would that be the original engine, David? It looks a bit like it, but it looks a bit sad. Yeah, I think it would be. But, uh, and there we are again uh, after she's been bailed out and uh, floating again. And that's an interesting slide of the boaters, for the boats on the navigation who know Sanford now. Um, that taken in 1981 no boat moorings whatsoever at Sanford. Uh, you can see the lock house on the right hand corner, uh, the road bridge and lock just below, but uh, no moorings at all. 1983, she's on the other side of the navigation at Sanford, um, again sunken and looking pretty forlorn. But the Preservation Society did their work, uh, they got her back up and running 
and they were using her on a regular basis. Here you can see their volunteers uh, on board, giving Susan a trip, and you can see that she's in pretty good condition in that, in that slide. This is a, a close-up showing the engine reinstalled, and uh, I'm sure some of you have seen Susan along the navigation. Uh, I find the chugging sound of that in engine really interesting. You can hear it chugging away, and you think, whatever is that? But if you know Susan, you know it's Susan chugging along the navigation. And then actually seeing her arrive and seeing the, uh, the width of the navigation, she takes up the whole of the channel, you then realise what this um, navigation was designed for. And I think in that respect, the lighters that are still on the navigation, the two of them, are very important because only seeing modern cruisers on the waterway gives a very false impression of why it was created and what sort of boats were originally using it. By 1984, uh, she was in need of major repairs. And the repairs really were beyond uh, the means of the Light Preservation Trust. Uh, so ownership therefore passed to Passmore Edwards Museum, uh, which is, is actually part of the London Borough of Newham. And at that time, we managed to actually acquire some funding from the Essex County Council. <coughs> I remember that quite well because I was working uh, for the County Council at the time. And uh, we managed to find uh, in the historic buildings section um, some money left in the water mills and windmills fund. And uh, that was uh, agreed by uh, members that it could actually be transferred to repair uh, Susan because of her importance to the navigation, which after all is part of the heritage of Essex. So she went to Cook's Boatyard in Molden, where repairs were undertaken. And then after that, she was moved out onto the salt flats at Molden, which uh, I think I seem to remember at the time, the navigation company the manager was not at all keen on having Susan back on the navigation. <coughs> he felt that she was a liability, uh, that she could sink after the previous experience, and uh, they didn't really want her back uh, because of that risk. <coughs> this is some of the work done in 1984, some replanking. Um, that work was all done in softwood, uh, which was the material used on the original boat. <coughs> But then, uh, after you know, resting on the uh, flats at Molden for some while, she was then, in 1991, donated to Chelmsford Museums and actually moved back up the navigation to Sandford Mill and moored uh, in the mill stream at Sandford Mill, which was in the ownership of the council. So, technically, she was off the navigation uh, and that kept the directors of the navigation happy. She was used there as a working exhibit aided again by Chelmer Lider Preservation Society, who were again carrying out repairs, uh, doing the running, doing the maintenance of her. Uh, and then in 1993, she had recorking, tarring with some Science Museum grant, and then further work again in 2002. So with a, a timber vessel like this, the work is constant. You've got to keep that re those repairs done. You've got to keep retiring her as well to protect the timber work. But throughout that time, she was still operated. She was uh, regularly seen up and down the navigation, especially when there were events. <coughs> this is uh, 1993, uh, when IWA uh, reopened the Springfield Basin after its restoration. Uh, Susan was a, a guest of honour, and you can see here arriving at um, what was then known as French's Yard uh, at the head of the basin. It was subsequently redeveloped as Waterfront Place. Uh, and is being redeveloped yet again today. Uh, I'm hoping it will keep its name, Waterfront Place, um, but it's, it's now uh, being re redeveloped, the car parking area there, as residential apartments currently underway. But uh, you can see there what a star she is. Uh, look at the photographers out there taking pictures of her arriving. Again, visiting Springfield Basin, 1997. This was the rally held in 1997 to commemorate the original opening of the navigation 200 years earlier. 
a, a rally of boats and events around the basin just to draw attention once again to the uh, heritage of the basin and draw people's attention to the fact that they actually had got a navigation in the middle of Chelmsford because not many years before this the whole of the basin was inaccessible there were the black timber uh, sheds all around the, the, the basin you couldn't get public access to it and it wasn't until uh, this sort of period um, that after the restoration various sites were redeveloped including this one here at Coates Quay by Higgins Home, you can see them advertising there, I think they were just finishing the development at the time and allowing public access onto that side of the navigation. So again, uh, featuring ad important events along the navigation. Here she is in 2001 out on a trip with some uh, I think friends of uh, the Light of Preservation Society and uh, possibly dignitaries. Um, in 2003, she was placed on the National Register of Historic Vessels. The aim of that, it very much added to the aim uh, to secure her long-term preservation. It showed her importance actually being recognised nationally, uh, particularly as she's the only one of her type. But it was also realised at that time that uh, she was in very poor condition once again. There'd been gribble attack on the bottom planks uh, of, of the boat. Uh, the gribble is a, a crustean that actually lives in the freshwater, a freshwater crustean that eats into the timber on, on the boats and this is another reason why she needs to be slipped regularly and the timber treated, the timber tarred to actually prevent uh, that erosion. So the council suspended operation, they decided they could no longer let people on board, they couldn't operate her for trips uh, and, uh, you know, she was just going to stay there. Uh, they couldn't afford to repair her and their suggestion was, well, we'll make her a land-based exhibit. We'll take her out of the navigation, we'll put her in the museum grounds and she will be there as uh, an exhibit for everybody to see when they visit the navigation. This is what uh, the Chelmer lighters used to look like. And a lot of us were very concerned about this because a land-based boat, uh, how long will it be a land-based boat? There is no need to really maintain it uh, in operational condition once it's on the land. And we were thinking she would not only deteriorate very quickly, but um, the whole point of a boat is a bit like a, a vintage car or a veteran car, is to operate it. They need to be used, they need to be um, seen actually operating. So quite a few people who had been uh, involved with Susan in the past uh, objected to this idea and because of that the Susan Trust was formed. The trustees came from those who were previously involved with operating Susan and had been involved with her and because of the formation of the trust the council agreed to transfer Susan to the trust and at the same time actually give the trust a dowry of £25,000 towards her repair work. So that was the start of the fundraising to see Susan restored. As I say, 2005, <coughs> this is the handover uh, at Sandford Museum. There's Lord Peter receiving the cheque for £25,000 from the Mayor of Chelmsford. Um, Susan in the background as well. And I think there was a series of photographs of her, um, of them actually on the boat at the time, uh, in spite of her precarious condition, uh, <laughs> actually uh, presenting the cheque as well. So while we were fundraising, she stayed on her mooring at Sanford Mill. Uh, she was used throughout that time as an exhibit for the school educational visits to the museum. Uh, the, albeit the pupils weren't allowed on board, they were allowed to go alongside her, they were even allowed to see her being moved slightly on her mooring to show how easy it is to move a, a large vessel, even a large vessel with 30 tonnes, once you get her moving on the water, very simple, a lot to, or, or not a lot of friction uh, to prevent her moving. So she, she was um, 
a valuable asset during that period of just being stationary at Sandford Mill. So the fundraising continued. Fundraising is always difficult. Um, we managed to achieve considerable local support. We made applications to Heritage Lottery Fund. Uh, we were encouraged, but uh, when it came to the decision time, we were told we were unsuccessful because they were oversubscribed. We applied again a few years later uh, after being encouraged yet again. At that time, we were told that all the funding was going into, uh, I think it was the Olympics. Um, so we haven't been particularly lucky with big grants from people like HLF. Um, however, in, in 2009, we realised that urgent repairs were needed and we couldn't wait for the completion of all our fundraising for the complete restoration project. We therefore arranged for a commencement on the restoration work, urgent repairs, uh, and we moved the boat up to St. Ozith. And I'll explain in a moment the repairs that we had recognised as being urgent. Uh, but first of all, we will show you her condition. Um, what uh, was realised that this main keelson, the centre keelson, which was replaced some years earlier by Cooks in Molden, it was replaced in softwood, and you can see there the rot coming along in, in that uh, keelson. Uh, this is the end of it, and that keelson is bolted through, through these floor ribs, or floors as they're called, bolted right the way through. So as you get rot, you get give on those bolts. And what was happening um, was that we realised, and I think you can see it on that slide, she'd got a bow coming. That keelson is no longer straight. There's quite a bow on it. And we realised if we didn't do something, she was actually going to break her back. You know, it, it would go completely and she'd break in half. Uh, then we'd have no way of actually moving her uh, to get repairs underway. So uh, in 2010, uh, we'd made the arrangements with St. Osith Boatyard. We'd received uh, three estimates for her repair um, from local shipbuilders, boat builders. And we decided on St. Osith as being not only the best price, but also uh, a boatyard with the right sort of facilities, dry dock facilities, and a very good reputation of actually working on Thames sailing barges, on, um, which are a lot more elaborate than Susan. But um, one of the recent projects they were completing at the time was Thalatta, uh, a complete um, restoration of a Thames sailing barge, uh, which was funded by Heritage Lottery. And uh, she is moored, I think, these winters in Haybridge Basin. You may well see her down there. She's in there at the moment. She tends to come in and winterise uh, in the basin and then you know, go off and work charters for the rest of the season. So here we are getting Susan ready for a move uh, to St. Osef, setting out uh, from the mooring at Sanford and uh, heading off down the cut towards uh, the first lock at Sandford. Uh, Essex Waterways provided the, um, their weed cutter to tow her, uh, together with some staff to assist and some volunteers, and uh, also Chelmer Lighter Preservation Trust volunteers on board for, for that journey. Uh, I suppose a sentimental journey, actually, down the navigation, uh, because it would be some years before she would actually return. Here she is on that trip uh, in Paper Mill Lock, and quite an interesting shot because you can see there um, she doesn't quite fill the whole width of the lock. If you look at the later barges, and I think possibly some of the earlier ones, they take up the whole width of the lock. Um, she's also got quite a pointed bow, which you know one assumes is, is because of the engine to actually give her a smoother line through the water. Uh, and a sim similar form at the back, at the stern. Uh, if you look at the more recent lighters, such as Julie, the steel lighter, they are squared off at the front, and they come along, and then they just go across almost at a right angle, which just gives room to actually open the lock gates. They totally fill the locks, 
and therefore they were a much more efficient form of vessel, much more efficient lighter uh, for use on the navigation. They could get a bigger payload and uh, you can probably you know, realise from that this is the reason why there was only one Susan ever built. Uh, she was almost um, old-fashioned by the time she'd been working a few years. Here we are continuing down towards Haybridge. I've just mentioned the more recent steel lighters. This is Julie. Uh, here she is passing Julie at Home Mill. Uh, and you can see there the, the design of the front um, of Julie. Very sort of splayed, no, no actual curve on her at all, which would be quite easy to do with steel work. But no, she she's, comes along, splays across, fills the whole lock up. And uh, Julie is um, currently still on the navigation. As far as we know, she is the only surviving steel lighter from the navigation. There are rumours that other lighters were sold onto the Thames uh, and uh, they, they were up at um, Maidenhead uh, Red and Reading. Uh, I must admit, when I've been in that area, I've, I've had a good look round in the uh, EA's yard up there, but have, have never actually identified any. Uh, there could still be some around, but as far as we know, Jude is the only one. Um, she was, had a, extensive overhauls in 2005 when Essex Waterways took on the navigation. Uh, we managed to do a deal with the administrator uh, who was going to scrap her, that uh, if we paid him a bit of extra money, he spent the money he was going to spend on scrapping her, on repairing her, and we would pay for the balance and uh, therefore she stayed on the navigation and is a very useful maintenance boat um, from Essex Waterway's point of view in uh, looking after the navigation. And we arrive at Haybridge Sea Lock. You can see the tarpauling on the front. Uh, of course she'd been stationary, somewhat, been stationary some while at Sanford and of course once you start moving her and with a, a keelson that is a little bit flexible uh, you soon find a few more leaks when you get to Haybridge than you had when you started off. But of course she's uh, got ahead from here up to St. Oseth. So that tarpaulin, uh, this is an old boatsman's trick I believe, was draped over the bow so that as she moved the water flowing against the hull pushed the tarpaulin against the leaks, against the timbers and helped cure them. Uh, any sailors here that's probably worth knowing but you probably knew it already. <laughs> So having realised that we'd got to make a start on, on Susan straight away because of the urgency uh, of the work on that main keelson, we decided that uh, we would break the restoration down into stages. The risk of doing this was that several of the funding bodies say they will not fund a project that has started and Heritage Lottery Fund are one such body. But having tried them twice and got nowhere, I think we decided, well, no point going there again. Um, we're going to have to look for other sources. But the other advantage of doing this is that you can, the, the people you're applying to grants, applying for grants too, can see some work in progress. Because one of the other problems we were having was that uh, we hadn't started work, we'd got money in the bank grants that had been given for the restoration. And anybody you ask for a grant wants to see your bank accounts, your annual you know, um, accounts, and um, they soon say, well, you don't need money. You know, you've got 25, 30,000 pound laying in the bank um, and nothing to show for it. So by starting it as well, we were able to illustrate some progress. So the stages that were identified, first of all, was the replacement of that main keelson, the centre keelson, as I've shown you. The second stage is repairs and replacements to the ribs and the upstands. Now I call them the ribs. That's the floor members uh, across the bottom of the boat that, that form the structure. The boat builders call them floors, just to confuse you. Um, and the upstands are the side ribs that are connected to those. So that was the second phase. Third phase is the chine planks, the, the planks around the bottom of the hull and the propeller tunnel framework because the propeller is actually inboard 
the, the hull comes up into forms a big recess so that the propeller is in the inside the hull as it were and doesn't project below the bottom of the boat because she is such a shallow drafted boat. The fourth stage was the shear strakes and replanking of the hull. That's the timbers around the top of the hull and obviously in the hull itself. Stage five is the gunnels and superstructure and then we get on to the, that completes the whole of the timber work on the boat. We then get on to reinstallation of the engine and stern gear and then a final stage which is almost a separate project in itself but ne nevertheless a very important one <coughs> and that is a cover and educational interpretation so that uh, she can be used for the future and earn her keep. Repair stages uh, are shown on there. It's probably a little bit small, but uh, when I, I talk about that's the main keels on stage one through the middle, the floors and ribs uh, coming in on stage two and the chine plank around the bottom and then shear strakes around the top on uh, stage, stage uh, four. The original estimate that we had was uh, in the region of £120,000 plus a contingency. However, once we got into St Osef, we were able to do more exploratory work, uh, which, as usual, I suppose, working on any historic building or historic boat, you find what is concealed. And also, during this period, the VAT rules changed. When we started, uh, fundraising, charities were exempt from VAT. The rules were then changed um, so that uh, you then had to pay VAT. Now, if you think about a cost of £120,000 uh, for a restoration, you put your VAT on that at 20%, uh, you've got a lot more funding, you've got to raise just to cover that VAT and pay it back to the government. Um, you know, it's times like that when you think, what is the point of all this? raising money you hope from government bodies and then giving it back to the government. Um, but nevertheless, we persevered and I'm pleased to say that the work that is now being done on Susan, we are employing, uh, there's been some changes at the boat yard, we're now employing the uh, boat builders direct and the boat builders are not registered for VAT. So whilst we would still have to pay VAT on materials, uh, we're not paying it on labour, which is obviously a main uh, feature of the restoration. Our current estimate of the total restoration cost for Susan is 143,000. Bear in mind as well that we are now 10 years on since we started the project. And on top of that, we estimate stage seven uh, as 20,000 pounds for the uh, display work, the cover, etc. Um, that is a bit of a guesstimate at the moment because uh, we don't have the final design work for that. Uh, efforts are all going into getting her actually restored uh, because I think stage seven is another project in its own right and hopefully should be a little bit easier to fund than perhaps the boat restoration. So here she is in uh, dry dock in St. Osef. Uh, Centre keelson has been removed. You can see where it was down the middle there and she's been cleaned out and uh, that shows you the condition some sections there of that centre keelson uh, being put to one side it shows you the condition the rot in that timber um, no wonder she was actually breaking her back and there's the new keelson fitted the new keelson is made from green heart which is a much stronger timber it's actually second hand timber that most of the sources of green heart at the moment seem to come from old uh, dock piles or harbour piles which is exactly where this came from the boatyard had bought a lot of green heart from Felixstowe docks when they were doing work there uh, and they put it through their, their band planer uh, take the edge off and you have got a really good solid straight timber uh, that will have a very long life in it so very pleased that we were able to actually use that and we we're aiming to use more green heart on her for um, the uh, side Kelsons here um, 
hopefully also some of, some of the uh, Kilsons around the bottom of the boat as well. Um, but one of our aims is that whilst we're changing the original specification, what has been accepted, and it's been accepted by the funders, is that we are creating a working vessel. Uh, there's a difference between uh, doing a restoration that is purely going to be stationary and stand in a museum or on a mooring and not be used. But if you are restoring an operational vessel, your restoration has to be that much more thorough. Uh, it's got to be robust, it's got to last, it's got to be safe in operation. It's got to take the bashes and bangs of operation. And this is, as I say, is accepted by people like PRISM who, who do the grants for us. Um, that we had to explain which stage of restoration we were going for uh, and that was the reason why we are changing some of the materials uh, to make sure that she does last longer but we're still working to the original design of the boat and uh, here you can see condition of the uh, the planking uh, the the caulking had shrunk I think it's been replaced with filler and the erosion around uh, the bottom Erosion at the bow of the planks. Uh, you can see how deep that is down the bottom here on the chine. And underneath, this is the gribble attack. Uh, those were originally two inch deep planks. Uh, and you can see here the gribble has, has got into them. Uh, there's erosion there that had left only about half an inch of thickness on the planks. And this is the reason why the council said no, she can no longer operate. Uh, they were worried somebody would actually tread on the plank and, and go through the bottom of the boat. Uh, and you have quite a disaster on your hands. And of course, I mentioned the exploratory work. We started taking off uh, the timbers around here. And you can see the rot in those. And the stage we're at at the moment is um, really we have uh, done most of the work now, or all the work on stages one to three. Um, the funding for those stages is illustrated here. We had the original £25,000 from Chelmsford Borough Council. We received £14,500 from the County Council Community Initiatives Fund. 3,000 from Essex Heritage Trust, 500 from Augustine Courtauld Trust, 1,000 from National Historic Ships Committee, 5,000 from Inland Waterways Association, Chelmsford Branch, and 5,000 from Chelmer Canal Trust here. And apart from that one uh, grant here, the National Historic Ships Committee, all those are local grants showing how uh, important she is to local people. This was quite a nice grant to receive the Historic Ships Committee because again, that's an important body. Uh, they don't give big grants, but the fact they are giving you some funding, again, acknowledges the importance of your project and of the boat. And in addition to that, the Susan Trust has raised, I've got here at 8,500, I think we're actually up to about 20, 25,000 uh, now. Uh, from donations and collections. I think I've acknowledged some of those donations later but haven't included them in the total here. And those donations have included uh, money from Chelmsford Society, Blackwater Boats, Sanford Lock Boaters, Sir Alistair Stewart who has been very good to us and also donated some oak timber which was taken up to the boatyard for the restoration work. And here we are back at the boatyard uh, with stage one uh, complete, although the Kelson was taken out again because to do stage two, the ribs or floors, uh, you have to thread all those underneath. So she had to actually be lifted. The boat was supported from underneath to keep her stable, but that allowed us to, to replace these floors. Now, when we started uh, the project, when we assessed it and the estimates, uh, it was thought that there were probably about um, 10 or so of these ribs that would have to be replaced. 
Uh, most of them appear to be in very good condition and knowing from work on historic buildings that um, with oak it's, it's the heart wood that's the important wood and it, uh, as long as that sound, a little bit of sapwood rot is not a problem. But as I say, we thought we've probably got about 10 or so uh, to replace. However, once we started taking off the timbers around here, which concealed the joints between the vertical ribs and the floor ribs, that's where we found the rot. Uh, these joints are formed by a metal bolt through that position. And of course, as soon as you get a metal bolt in wet conditions, you get rust. That rust creates rot around it. So the majority of these joints were actually found to be unsound. And doing a restoration of this type whereby you want the boat now to go on uh, and not have to keep coming back to be taken to pieces and rebuilt, uh, it, the decision was made we're going to have to replace uh, a lot more of the floors and the ribs. And we've probably ended up, whereas originally we thought we might uh, replace 10 of them, we've probably only got 10 or less of the originals left. We have kept them where we can, but you can see there a pretty major uh, rebuild work. There are some originals still in there, uh, but uh, there is an awful lot of new oak timber. But in saying that, we are obviously ending up with a boat uh, that will have had a very heavy overhaul and rebuild, and uh, we'll be able to operate her hopefully for many years before uh, work has to be done again. Here we are, uh, this is the boat builder, um, trying to uh, assess whether we can use the green heart, this is cut down as a green heart plank, to do the bottom chine to actually bend that round the shape of the boat in one section. This is steamed to do it, and I think he was quite pleased with that work that it actually uh, did show that we can do it. So we can replace those chines in green heart, which will, you, you saw in the earlier slide how the original timbers had eroded along that point, along the sort of water line. Uh, hopefully by using the green heart, we won't have that sort of problem in the future. But the steam is done these days, n not in a box as it used to be done, but they uh, create plastic tubes uh, and seal the ends and then pump the uh, steam into those uh, and then, you know, uh, heat the timber up, steam it in that manner and then put it into place. And here is the, the bow of the boat with the knee uh, replaced. Uh, again, we were wondering quite where we were going to find a suitable piece of timber uh, to create the knee, but the boatyard found it. Uh, it's not been finally worked here, it's put into position, it's being cramped and placed, and then it will be worked so that it fits beautifully onto that uh, Kilson. Another one showing the, the work of stages, stage two, nearing completion, stage three as well. Uh, but then you start looking at the propeller tunnel, uh, see the, the rot in here in the form as on the tunnel and on the, the boarding on top of it. Of course, when she's lying in the open without any cover, uh, you get leaves and water on, on timbers like this and in the bottom of the boat, which don't do her any good, they, they all tend to rot. So that's why it's very important that uh, uh, the final stage of the restoration is a cover uh, to protect her, particularly during the winter period and when she's not being used. This is rebuilding of the propeller tunnel. Uh, again, very fortunate in... These originally were formed from three separate timbers all bolted together and of course all those joints are then vulnerable, particularly with shrinkage, but uh, we've been able to actually form those from each one, from one single piece uh, of, uh, I think this was our Rocco, wasn't it, rather than Greenheart? I thought it was Sapili, actually. Sapili, right, it's, it's certainly hardwood and yeah. Uh, so again, we, we've got a, a much longer uh, life in the material uh, and without the problem joints. And here we are uh, with those in place and uh, this is really the stage we've got to, completion of stage three, uh, which also included putting on the bottom chine plank 
again that had to be molded into shape but it holds the bottom in place what we now need to be doing is putting the top shear strakes on to hold the top of the whole structure in place uh, unfortunately uh, we got to the stage where we didn't have the funding uh, late last year to actually complete that. So late last year we were at the stage where stages one, two and three had been completed last October. Um, we then had run out of money and uh, we were desperately all this period making grant applications but we went through a period of very little success I think you know the times were bad a lot of people looking for grant money uh, and uh, we were drawing a lot of uh, sorry uh, nice project but we can't help you um, we have however now uh, raised the money for stage four the next stage and that has actually commenced within the last two weeks our estimate for stage five uh, has had to be upped um, because of the uh, time lag between the original estimate and the extra work that was found. Uh, so stage five is estimated at about 35,000. Stage six, putting the engine back. Stage five, sorry, will we'll complete the timber superstructure. That will be all the timber work. Stage six is then putting the engine back. Uh, and then stage seven is the display and, and the cover. The funding in place for stage four has come from these sources. Um, the, the trust had actually spent uh, over 4,000, nearly 4,500 pounds on timber. Uh, we purchased an Iroko tree ready for the work when it was available and so that could season ready for carrying out the work. Uh, we had a nice uh, anonymous donation of £4,655 towards the stage of the work. We have had £5,000 from Essex Heritage Trust, £5,500 uh, promised from County Councils or approved by County Councils Community Initiative Fund again, continuing support from them. And then the grant that's made the commencement of stage four possible, the PRISM Fund, uh, which uh, is a museums, <coughs> the National Museum Service, grant aiding body, uh, they have awarded us £20,000, they've already paid up half of that. Um, we've got to earn the remaining 10000 by producing various work and reports for them, um, but uh, that has meant that we now have our total here of just on £40,000 to commence stage four. And as I say, that work is now underway, the, the dry dock has been moved. Uh, closer to the boatyard um, and boat builders have been employed. They've already started uh, preparatory work. Stage four will be the shear strakes or the top planks, as I said, to tie the whole frame together. And we will then start replanking the bottom and the sides. The, the replanking again is going to be done in Iroko because we want a material that is going to have a much longer life than those softwood planks and it's going to be double planked. Uh, it's a traditional boat building technique but you, your lower row of planks cover the joints of the other row. Um, not only does that give you better protection if you've got any shrinkage, it gives you better protection against leakage, but it also gives you a thinner, almost sacrificial outer skin. So if it does have a gribble attack or if it has damage through hitting the bottom, etc., it's a lot easier just to take that bottom skin off or a section of it and replace it. So again, we are thinking about the long-term maintenance of the boat. Uh, also in this stage are the chines and inner chines. Uh, those are the timbers I showed you on the earlier slide and replanking and completing the propeller tunnel. That will then leave just stage five to finish off the timber work, which will be the gunnels at the top of the, uh, and superstructure around the top of the boat. Um, we have already started fundraising for, for that. Uh, we've got to find around about 35,000. We have some leads, we have some applications in, but I think for every, um, what, probably six or seven applications you make or more, uh, you might be lucky if you get one. Um, you know, it, it can be a lot of work, but I, I think 
our hope is now that having shown we are well underway, we're on the downward slope as it were, that fundraising will come. The fact we are now getting support nationally from people like Prison, um, we were hoping we might get some grant from uh, the Transport Trust as well as small grant, but again that acknowledges the importance of the boat nationally. And it's our aim that uh, this time we can carry on with the work because we had to stop work for a year or more through lack of funds. Every time you stop work, you lose your, your boat builders. They went off on another job. When we went back to the boatyard, that team were actually had started another vessel that had now got funding. Um, so we want to keep the team we've got at the present time. We want to keep her in the dry dock. We had to leave her in the dry dock while we weren't working there is a tremendous risk there that you're going to be paying fees for the hire of a dry dock that you're not using. So far we haven't had any charges for that, keeping our fingers crossed that uh, we may not, but uh, we, we could well. Uh, we are supposed to be paying them. Uh, so it is important if we can keep that continuity going. And who knows, I mean, will we get there next year? Will we see her return to the navigation 2016? Great if we can. It uh, is something we should aim at, uh, but if not, hopefully very soon after. And then the future of Susan. I mean, our aim is to use her for public trips. We want her to work on the navigation. Uh, there is always public interest in her at uh, open days and, and even you know, other uh, nice sunny days on the navigation. Uh, for taking public on paying trips to raise income, to fund her and restore her. To keep her as an educational exhibit at Sanford Mooring, part of our deal there was with the council that she has a free mooring, so that reduces our overheads, and it also puts her in the centre of a, a visitor attraction that hopefully has got a, a, a much more uh, vibrant future than it has at the moment. We've, we're hoping the museum will be used more. We want to uh, create, or sorry, use her as a mobile visitor <coughs> interpretation centre. There isn't really any interpretation on the navigation at the moment, and we don't feel that it's the sort of thing you can put in a building somewhere unless it went into a tea room or somewhere that's earning money. You, you can't afford to employ staff or volunteers on, a, on an ex exhibition centre. Uh, interpretation centre on a navigation of this size but Susan could fulfil that role as she goes up and down the navigation attends various events festivals etc uh, part of that is this overall enclosure that we hope we will be able to make design so it can be used almost as a tent for exhibitions or can be lifted up to give headroom when we're exhibiting on the boat very important to her future is the regular retiring of the hull um, we are planning that this will hopefully be done every couple of years. It does mean taking her out of the navigation because there's no means of slipping her or lifting her on the navigation at the moment. Uh, so it would have to go around to Molden. But uh, we are um, aiming to operate her with volunteers. Um, not only continuing volunteers from Chelmer Lighter Preservation Society, but from all the other bodies and societies that are involved with the Trust. We will be looking for volunteers, uh, not only, as I say, to operate her and maintain her. So, our fundraising continues. We're hoping we will add your support. And can I thank you all on behalf of the Susan Trust? And remind you, we do have a little part. All these bits help, particularly as they are local donations. Thank you very much.